Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just before we get going with our event today, I would just like to start off um, by acknowledging that this event is being hosted on the land of Treaty 7 people, which includes the Blackfoot First Nation tribes of Siksika, Dana, and Pigani, the Stony Nakota First Nation tribes of Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley, and the Sutina First Nation. This area is also homeland to the historic Northwest Métis and to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We are grateful to live, work, and play in these lands and honor the rights and dignity of the peoples who came before us. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Zoe Johnson. I'm the coordinator of partnerships and engagement for the Canadian Committee for the UN International Year of Glacier Preservation. I'm really excited to welcome you to our event today about the state and fate of Canada's snow and ice. Uh, before we get going with our presentation, I'm just gonna start by giving a little bit of background on the Glacier Year and what it's about here in Canada. So to begin, uh, back in 2022, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution to declare 2025 as the year of glacier preservation and March 21st along with it as World Day for Glaciers, which is why we are gathered here today. Um, they called upon the member states or countries of the United Nations uh, to develop their own contributions, and that's what our team is doing here for Canada. Uh, but internationally, the event is being co-led by the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, and the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. And globally speaking, the objective of the year is to raise awareness about the critical role of glaciers, snow, and ice in the climate system and the hydrological cycle, and the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the impending changes in the Earth's cryosphere. Now, I just wanna take a second to introduce this term to anyone who's not familiar, because the cryosphere is very central to what the glacier year is all about and why it matters in Canada. So the cryosphere, for those of you who don't already know, uh, refers to areas of the earth where water exists in any of its frozen forms. So that includes snow, glaciers, permafrost, ice sheets, ice shelves, icebergs, uh, and so on. Essentially, when you hear cryosphere, just think frozen. Um, and so the glacier year is an opportunity to talk about why our frozen regions matter and how climate change is affecting them. And this is also why we're so excited about the glacier year in Canada, because the Canadian cryosphere is absolutely huge. We have lots and lots of frozen land. And importantly, we also have very deep connections to snow and ice, uh, culturally, socially, economically, and resource-wise. And that goes from things like the iconic color of Lake Louise, whose brilliant blue is actually the result of fine ground sediments in the water, also known as glacier flower, um, to snow and ice related uh, activities across the country. And of course, through our freshwater supply with many of Canada's rivers beginning in snow-capped mountains. And these rivers then in turn feed many drinking water systems, uh, agriculture and irrigation, hydropower systems, and maintain the integrity of our ecosystems. And so in Canada, this year of glacier preservation is about the commitment to understand and appreciate where we live. It's about the willingness to remember and learn what our cryosphere means to our water, our culture, and our lives. And this is something that we hope to do through both science and research, as well as art and creative expression. We know that climate change is rapidly changing snow and ice conditions here in Canada, uh, and we want to make sure that we understand what is going on so that we can prepare, react, and adapt as appropriate. And that's the idea behind our slogan, which is observe, predict, protect solutions for a deglaciating future. Now, before we move on, I just want to give a really big thank you to our whole entire team. Uh, none of this could be done without you. And I also want to thank our expanding list of partners. Uh, your support and enthusiasm are very deeply appreciated. We're gonna be hearing from four speakers today. We have our three main presenters, John Pomeroy, who will be discussing observations and predictions of changing mountain snow, ice, and water. Alison Cristatello, who will be talking about contaminant transfer in the Canadian Arctic. And Bob Sanford, who will be talking about the importance of snow and ice to the economy, culture, and sustainability. He'll be telling us why glaciers matter. Uh, we're gonna end off with Corinne Schuster-Wallace, who will give us a little bit of information about downstream connections and World Water Day. And just to go through some logistics of today's event, it will be one hour long. It will, it's going to end at noon and is being recorded and it's gonna be made available on our website, uh, which is being linked in the chat. The last 10 or so minutes are gonna be used to answer audience questions. And that's gonna be after all of the speakers have finished. And we ask that you please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. And now with further ado, I would like to present to you, John Pomeroy. So if you just give me a minute, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There we go, okay. Uh, so, John Pomeroy is the International Co-Chair and Global Science Li Liaison on the Canadian Steering Committee for the International Year of Glaciers Preservation, and he is the Director of the Global Water Futures Program and its follow-along Global Water Future Observatory Project at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he is the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change and is a UNESCO Chair in Mountain Water Sustainability. Dr. Pomeroy is going to talk to us today about observations and predictions of changing mountain snow, ice, and water resources. Uh, thank you very much for being here. 
Uh, thank you so much, Zoe, for that uh, kind introduction. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, we'll uh, jump right into the uh, presentation, and I'm going to take us on a little bit of a global tour and then down into a very uh, localized uh, uh, discussion of what we're seeing in the Canadian Rockies. So the uh, so to start off, um, the snow cover trends around the world are, in fact, quite disturbing. Uh, satellites have been able to measure global snow cover since around the early 1970s. So we have over 50 years now of observations. And as you can see, in uh, many areas, the brown uh, colored colors on the map are showing where uh, we've had uh, reductions in snow covered days over the year. Uh, the uh, darkest brown is about 15 days reduced snow covered period um, over, over time. And the uh, and blue is where we see increased snow cover over time. If you look over Western North America, uh, it's mostly reductions in uh, snow cover period, some pretty large, so 10 to 15 days. Uh, same for the Alps, uh, same for the Caucasus, uh, some parts of the Himalaya, uh, high mountain Asia, and uh, parts of the high mountains in Siberia in that situation as well as other parts of the circumpolar Arctic. And this has tremendous implications on water supply, glacier uh, survival itself, and the downstream uh, and local ecosystems, uh, such as these views from the Colorado Rockies uh, of an early melt and uh, leading to a season of very severe forest fires as one example. Uh, but it affects the whole ecosystem from large mammals to uh, plant ecology. And of course, water supply uh, from snow melt is the uh, primary uh, a primary source of stream flow in rivers emanating from mountains around the world. Associated with this a reduction in snowpack is the global glacier thinning. And uh, uh, this is uh, measurements by uh, Chauvinet and other authors on glaciers around the world for changes in the elevation of these glaciers um, from 2000 to 2019. And they used uh, satellite imagery uh, uh, with basically photogrammetry to work out the elevations of these. Red are glaciers that are getting thinner, um, and darker red is uh, even thinner. And you can see in uh, Western Canada and Alaska, invariably, uh, very, very rapid rates of uh, thinning anywhere from uh, half up to uh, one over one meter uh, per year of thinning overall. Uh, but also fairly consistent throughout the Andes, particularly down into Patagonia and South America, uh, throughout Baffin Island, uh, Ellesmere Island uh, in Canada, the uh, around the measurable parts of Greenland, uh, Iceland, Scandinavia, the Caucasus, the Alps, the Pyrenees in particular, and some parts of high mountain Asia, uh, the Himalayas, but uh, not all, not all the Chen Chen mountains and uh, Pamir's uh, more mixed results. In that case, in some cases, precipitation increases are still increasing glaciers, but the vast majority of glaciers are thinning very rapidly right now. Why is this important? Well, in North America, a mountain snow and ice are critical for the continental water resources. The uh, ranges like the Canadian Rockies and the northern extension of the U.S. Rockies are the headwaters for rivers that flow into the Gulf of Mexico, the Hudson Bay and the Atlantic Ocean from both streams through the Mackenzie to the Arctic Ocean, through the Fraser and Columbia to the Pacific Ocean. So they are the hydrological apex of North America and incredibly important for driving the economies, the ecologies, communities over vast, vast areas far, far away from the mountain headwater sources that you see. So we're in a special time now, um, as, as Zoe mentioned, uh, we're on the cusp of the International Year of Glaciers Preservation, and I'm going to talk about how some of the solutions for deglaciating future um, uh, uh, can be categorized by observing, predicting, pre and protecting. And the artwork you see is from Gennady Ivanov, artist in the Transitions Project associated with Global Water Futures. And uh, so I thank him for that, of uh, disintegrating Pedo Glacier here. So solutions, one solution is to observe. And an example of this is the uh, World Climate Research Program's GWEX project, which is the Global Energy and Water Cycling Experiment. And it has a network called INARCH, the International Network for Alpine Research Catchment Hydrology. This is a network of a, a vast number of research basins in mountains around the world that are well instrumented, recording open data that is openly shared 
And this is a place where we can test models, learn about the changes that are occurring. This is where the fundamental science is, is occurring. It's a very, very exciting program. And our next meeting will be in China in the uh, as we go uh, to the Tibetan Plateau area for examinations of their sites. So we are very grateful to the Chinese Academy of Sciences for hosting our next meeting. In uh, closer home in the Rockies, the part of NARCH uh, that is in the Canadian Rockies is part of the Global uh, Water Futures Observatories project uh, funded by the Ca Canada Foundation for Innovation. So a variety of stations and also a few stations from our collaborators at University of Calgary, uh, stretching from the Columbia ice fields down into Kananaskis country. And so these are well instrumented sites uh, measuring precipitation, temperature, humidity, snowpack, soil moisture, groundwater, glacier height changes, um, even the weight of snow on a hanging tree, and uh, all this automated, uh, but with frequent site visits from our uh, laboratory technicians at the Coldwater Lab in Canmore. Uh, one thing we do is uh, go to Pato Glacier every year and fly drones over it to measure very carefully its retreat. These are drones with lasers uh, to uh, very carefully measure the glacier surface and area. And so you see the change from 2019 to 2023, uh, Pato Glacier retreated over 400 meters uh, in that period of time and melted downwards 29 meters in the lower part of the ice. Uh, uh, last year uh, was particularly disastrous with seven to nine meters of ice melt uh, over a large section of the glacier and, uh, and another 80 uh, meters of retreat. Uh, that year. And you can see the surface level change from 2002 to 2003 uh, with some collapse of an ice cave, but the rest of this is due to uh, primarily to ice melt uh, through here. So uh, with uh, Natural Resources Canada Geological Survey, who conduct long-term mass balance measurements going back to 1965, Pato is our canary in the coal mine and the canary isn't looking very good. So solutions. Uh, solutions can come through models to help us anticipate the future and predict uh, what will happen. Uh, these, this is a coupled climate glacier hydrological model called MESH uh, that we developed with Environment Canada. Uh, it's run for a uh, high uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario for the future. And if we look at the Bow River at Banff and at Calgary, we see much earlier stream flows coming. Uh, some flood peaks at Banff may be getting a little higher, maybe a little lower at Calgary, but the late summer flow is dropping dramatically. This looks a lot like uh, 2023 in the drought year, uh, but in fact, uh, the uh, red is the simulations for, for the mid-2080s to 2100. So uh, the rivers aren't drying up, they're not disappearing, but without the glacial contribution and with a shift to rainfall instead of snowmelt, uh, much more variable, much higher winter flows, much lower summer flows, and very flashy. We can take the same model and uh, test it up at the Athabasca River uh, to Jasper. And in here we uh, can include with and without glacier retreat. And uh, so if we look at the 2040s in yellow, the baseline flows uh, with a peak around July. Uh, with climate change, that peak uh, comes much earlier. But when we use the LCC runs, the glacier retreat, land cover change, and climate change, you're seeing a big drop in the summer flows in there. That's because the glacier is becoming much smaller and we're starting to lose their contribution. By the time we go to the late part of the 21st century, there's a massive shift. Uh, flows are coming a month earlier, much higher winter flows. Um, and if the glaciers were magically held in place and preserved, we would have very, very high flows over late summer, but it's not gonna happen. Uh, so the pale pink is what is more likely to happen. Dramatic drop in stream flows from July 1st onward uh, to about a quarter of what they would be now uh, due to the lack of glacier uh, proofing. And of course, those uh, results even worse in the drought years. So how can we predict uh, in high resolution that people want uh, for many areas, for ski areas, to transport, to water supply? This is a model called the Canadian Hydrological Model. Uh, which uh, runs over uh, millions and millions of grid cells over Western Canada. We do this operationally. You can get a uh, forecast yourself from snowcast.ca. Chris Marsh developed this as part of his PhD. And uh, this allows us to uh, look at the changing snowpacks and how it affects our water resources, glaciers, and others. Uh, and this is something now running in South America and we're exploring its development in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, right now. And it gives us snowpack, snow water equivalent, down to 50 meters resolution, which is where we need it in the mountains. 
Okay, so we need to protect as well. And to protect means bringing society into this. We need to co-create our knowledge with communities, both indigenous and non-indigenous. We need to improve our training and capacity, uh, make sure our research is being used for adaptation, make sure we have active outreach programs, community science programs, put that modeling to work for society. And this is done through partnerships and sustainable development. We developed a lot of these ideas in Global Water Futures and the UNESCO Chair in Mountain Water Sustainability that Corinne Schuster-Wallace is also a shareholder in is a nice model for how to bring this forward. So finally, um, I was up with our technical team on Pato Glacier earlier this week in the spring equinox, March 19th. It was above freezing, the wind was calm, that was strange, but it had been seven degrees on the ice two days previously for two days in a row. Um, it was patchy snow cover, exposed glacier ice, and we noticed, uh, you see the black tape on the uh, mounting of this uh, uh, instrument here, that was at the ice service at the end of August last year. So that's 1.14 meters of ice melt since the end of August 2023, over the, what we consider to be the winter period for glaciers. So we need to hurry up and preserve the glaciers. They're melting in March this year, which is a disaster. So finally, I'll give you some thought-provoking art from Gennady Ivanov. Uh, we have choices that we can make. Uh, we can observe, predict, protect. We can mitigate the impacts of climate change on our mountain snow and ice around the world, or we can fail to mitigate and to adapt. And this is a painting of uh, a, uh, even a modern city like Dubai, perhaps going underwater as sea levels rise as mountain glaciers and then the major ice uh, sheets and caps uh, start to melt around the world. So I'll wrap up there and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pomeroy. Uh, up next, we have Allison Crisitello. Uh, she is an ice core scientist and high altitude mount mountaineer. Her research ex explores the history of sea ice and polar regions using ice core chemistry, which she has conducted in Antarctica, Alaska, the Canadian High Arctic and Greenland. She's the director of the Canadian Ice Core Lab at the University of Alberta and is an adjunct professor at the University of Calgary. And she is also a National Geographic Explorer. Uh, she's gonna talk to us today about contaminant transfer in the Canadian Arctic. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just share here. Oh, it's hard to follow John. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel and event today. Um, I have been tasked with discussing the North, and instead of focusing on something that I thought maybe many in the audience would know quite a bit about, I, I thought I'd spend this time focused on a little bit of a, a different angle. So I thought I'd I'd show you some recent work, and this is sort of in the observed category <laughs> that John was just talking about, on environmental contaminant findings in the Canadian High Arctic. And uh, this work is thanks to a very strong collaboration between my lab, the Canadian Ice Core Lab, and Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, particularly Drs. Amila De Silva and Cora Young. So just to, to quickly situate everyone here, um, here are the locations of the main ice cores and locations that I'll be talking about. On the top right, we can see most of Canada as well as Greenland, uh, with this circle showing the eastern side of the Canadian Arctic archipelago that I'll be speaking about. And then this large map zooms into the core sites. So there's three on Ellesmere Island that I'll speak of, Agassiz Ice Cap, Mount Oxford, and Prince of Wales Ice Field. And then there's one on Devon Ice Cap on Devon Island, a little bit farther south. So I, I'd like to share a few recent findings. And the first one is a look at perfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, which you may have heard of. Uh, drinking water supplies are monitored for about 40 plus PFAS, and they are a large class of chemicals that are largely used in two commercial applications, fire suppressant and nonstick technologies. Now the perfluorinated acids are an important class and they include other acronyms you may have heard of, PFCAs and PFSAs. Uh, and so some of this class of chemicals are persistent in the environment and they've been dubbed forever chemicals, uh, meaning that they have no known degradation pathway in the environment. So we drilled a suite of ice cores on Devon ice cap to allow us to investigate the potential transport of these chemicals to the remote Arctic. And in short, uh, the results from this study demonstrated that some PFAS have both continuous and increasing deposition on Devon ice caps. This is a remote part of the Canadian high Arctic. 
um, despite recent North American and international regulations and phase outs. And we proposed here that this is the result of ongoing manufacture use and emissions of these compounds and their precursors, as well as other newly unidentified compounds uh, in regions mostly outside of North America. So we, by also modeling air mass back trajectories and comparing trends over time in deposition with production changes from possible sources, we find that sources particularly from continental Asia, Asia are the large contributors to the global pollutants impacting Devon ice cap. And this assessment here really has allowed us to characterize the depositional profile of some of this class of chemicals, uh, particularly on Devon ice cap, and to further understand the long range transport mechanisms of these persistent pollutants. Now, in a, in a second recent study I wanted to share with you, again, collaborating with Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as University of Toronto, Memorial University and York. We utilized new ice cores drilled on a Devon ice cap as well as Mount Oxford, which was that far northern site uh, on Ellesmere Island and uh, was assisted here by a uh, Bow Valley based friend and colleague, Jocelyn Hirose. Um, so we're on this, in this study, we're investigating the deposition of short chain perfluorinated carboxylic acids or short chain PFCAs. Okay, what are these things? Um, so when CFCs were discovered to be ozone depleting, as well as greenhouse gases, they were regulated and phased out under the Montreal Protocol in 1987. And CFC replacements included compounds that, of course, have lower ozone depleting potential. However, these CFC replacements themselves undergo atmospheric transformation, some of which form these short chain PFCAs which are persistent organic pollutants in the environment with no known degradation pathway. So these persistent pollutants, again, the degradation products of CFC replacement compounds make their way to the most remote environments on earth. And we care about this because a few preliminary studies have shown toxicity of these substances to plants and invertebrates, but I would say perhaps more importantly, it's another grand experiment we're doing. And we don't really know, in fact, a lot of the impacts that this class of compounds uh, will have in the, in the environment. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I thought I'd mention here as well that these new cores, um, yeah, the, the plot here is showing that there's actually a tenfold increase in short chain PFCA deposition between 1986 and 2014. And this was the very first multi-decadal record of short chain PFCA deposition in the Arctic. So these are, are things that we're only just starting to even analyze for um, in the Canadian high Arctic. And these results really shown a bright spotlight um, on I think what needs more monitoring. Um, we got a lot of heat from chemical companies, which I thought was a great thing and, show, and shows that this kind of research needs to be, um, needs to be done. And it, it really, just highlights as well that we need a more holistic approach when deciding to ban and replace chemical compounds um, because chemicals degrade and developing a strong understanding of how they degrade in the environment and what they degrade to is vital. And I'll, I'll mention here quickly as well that we've just begun to look at microplastics um, in the, all of these locations and others across the Canadian high Arctic, uh, particularly postdoc here, Bonnie Hamilton, um, and looking at microplastics as vectors for chemical additive contamination. Um, so this is a, a new addition to, to a lot of these studies. And then lastly, and most recently, um, a few months ago, we published a ice core results as well, focused on determining temporal trends of 25 organophosphorus flame retardants and plasticizers or OPEs. Um, and the, the depositional flux, again, to, to Devon Ice Cap, as well as some of these northern Ellesmere sites for many OPEs, has exponentially increased over nearly four decades. And in short, we have shown here that the ability of these chemicals to undergo long-range transport, um, as well as their ubiquitous presence, tells us we need to do a bit more monitoring. Um, and the more northern and remote site here, the one on Ellesmere, had lower fluxes of OPEs than the more Southern Devon ice cap site. So these results suggest as well, 
that the atmospheric lifetimes of these OPEs, this particular class of compounds here, is longer than predicted. And also that transport to the Arctic may be occurring via aerosols, including anthropogenic particles. Um, and ice fields across the circumpolar Arctic are shrinking due to climate warming. And it is likely um, that they will become a source of OPEs through meltwater to downstream locations. And this is something we think about here, um, closer to home on the Columbia ice field, for example, um, that in a warming world, um, we're sort of unlocking and releasing contaminants that may have accumulated um, over very long periods of time. Thought I'd use a quick second to um, just tell you that the lab here, to any, any potential future collaborators out there, please know that the Canadian Ice Core Lab is a lab for all Canadians. We have exceptional capabilities here, a growing team of phenomenal and multidisciplinary scientists and um, an analytical chemistry lab and working freezers open to all. So if you have new ideas of new ways we can collaborate to tackle important pressing environmental questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Crisitello. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Bob Sanford. Bob Sanford is the national co-chair on the Canadian Steering Committee for the United Nations International Year Glacier Preservation and is a senior government affair liaison, global climate emergency response at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. Uh, Mr. Sanford is going to talk to us today about the importance of snow and ice to Canada's economy, culture and sustainability. Uh, he is gonna tell us why glaciers matter. Thank you. Well, thank you, Zoe, for the kind introduction. And please allow me to begin by extending the very best wishes of the United Nations to all. The United Nations University for a uh, University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health is proud to be a founding partner in the UN International Year of Glaciers Preservation in Canada. And as Zoe said, I have been invited to speak today on the importance of snow and ice to Canada's culture, economy, and sustainability. And in that context, in its essence, I've been invited to explain why glaciers matter to the average person. And this is an important question for us at UNU. We are as much a cultural institution as we are a research university. And finding the words to meaningfully and unforgettably describe our current situation as it is reflected in the global water emergency is one of our greatest challenges. Part of our contribution to the year, therefore, will be literary and oral in some extent. We intend to write and publish a book about the year, and we want to include the activities of our other partners in that book. So as John Pomeroy offered, become a partner now, <clears throat> be included, the book is the hook. We have secret broader ambitions for the year. We are of the view that the saddest possible outcome of the climate crisis will have been that most Canadians will have never seen what we were losing. Going, going, gone without most Canadians even imagining what we lost, what was lost or what it was meant. And our central task of the glacier year from our perspective then is to make glaciers the central character in a new story an epic oral story that will hopefully be passed on through future generations in which we in our time invited publics to imagine themselves as actors in a heroic narrative in which humanity saw that the glaciers, planet's glaciers were trying to warn us of and they were trying to warn us of a great peril and that we responded in time to avoid that peril by exercising its collective voice, humanity in this new story rose up to demand more responsive policies of governments and in so doing rescued the planet from climate disaster and on the way restored confidence in the possibilities of democracy. Now we hope to achieve this ambitious goal by somewhat more modest means, however, before all else, the UN Glacier Year will be a great test of whether we can collectively find the right words to express just how much glaciers matter to us and to the world. And in this, we are relying heavily on our partners. So to that end, let me begin by starting the conversation on why glaciers matter to our culture, economy, and our political stability and our sustainability. Culturally, 
if we have an identity as a people, the backdrop is always water. Think of the beautiful images that come to mind when the world thinks of Canada. Can you imagine anything in the world as stupendous as Lake Superior or as beautiful as Lake Louise? Think of the magic of these names, Moraine Lake, Lake of the Hanging Glaciers, the Nahani, the Mackenzie, the Saskatchewan, the Bow. Beneath each of these names is a glacier story. The country we love was shaped by glaciers. We walk on what ice is shaped and reshaped. Where they remain, glaciers mean majesty. They mean inspiration. In their breathtaking presence, one can be overwhelmed by aesthetic arrest. It is with good reason Parks Canada has made our glaciers UNESCO World Heritage Site attractions. Now that said, we don't mean anything to glaciers. It was Mark Twain who said, a man who keeps company with glaciers comes to feel tolerably insignificant by and by. We are uh, too fleeting to be of interest in ice, to be of interest to the ice, but glaciers mean a great deal to us. Uh, glaciers mean snow. Snow means winter, winter means Canada. Glaciers also provide social, economic, and political stability that comes from possessing a relatively stable climate to which we have prosperously adapted. What is being missed at present is the loss of glacier ice is a symptom of a much, much larger problem that John Pomeroy has described. The same warning, warming that is causing our glaciers to rapidly disappear is at the same time reducing snowpack and the duration and extent of snow cover through parts of the country. Snowpack and snow cover in many areas have been declining. The fundamental hydrology of the Canadian West, including the prairies, is changing right before our very eyes. But it doesn't just stop there. Almost all of the Earth's snow and ice-covered land is located in the Northern Hemisphere. What we have discovered is that 10 trillion metric tons of water are shifted from one hemisphere to the other in the form of winter snow cover during only one annual seasonal cycle. Imagine 10 trillion tons of water moving back and forth between the hemispheres each spring and fall. That snow, however, does not just affect the lives of Canadians. The cold of that snow affects the climate of the entire planet. That snow and ice are powerful climatic refrigerants that control the natural thermostat that has for millions of years regulated the climate of the entire hemisphere. In the absence of glaciers and with the decline of winter snow, the total amount of energy stored at any given time in the global climate system will increase dramatically, altering the stability of the natural climate thermostat of our continent. And once the glaciers are gone, the ongoing loss of snow's refrigerating impact and feedback will cause land surfaces to warm and atmospheric temperatures to rise rapidly with direct consequences for every ecosystem in this country and every person who lives on this continent. The reliability of Canada's food production and the stability of our communities and our economic system rely on how much snow falls and how much water is available in spring when that snow melts. Glaciers matter because they are compressed snow. Glaciers are hard evidence of the importance of water to our way of life. They are water in the bank upon which our economy, stability, and sustainability depend. Glaciers are part of our hydrological operating fund from which we borrow, especially in late summer, and repay through the fall and spring. Glaciers, or their loss, means trouble. What happens when you overdraw at the bank? You have to borrow and pay interest on your loan. If you don't or can't pay off that interest, it grows. And if it continues to grow and you can't pay, then sooner or later, to your utter astonishment, you are bankrupt. We at UNU see this often. Don't worry, a nation state will tell us, we got this drought, and suddenly they don't. But glaciers are not just water in the bank, they are a future in the bank. How does having water in the bank allow us to continue as a civilization, and what would water bankruptcy mean? Glaciers are like the Earth's hourglasses. In the geological history of the planet, when the sands of the hourglass run out in any given epoch, 
the earth system will turn the hourglass over and the sands of time with the aid of orbital and axial eccentricities of our earthly home will arrive predictably back at another glaciation. Time stutters on, but not now. Why? There is evidence that in a warming world, we have forestalled the next natural glacial cycles indefinitely. And in so doing, we've halted time and stalled evolution. We have become a threat to the world that created us. We are limiting so much of the life that it in its diversity allowed us to advance and fuel our civilization. In our epic narrative, the one we want to write and share, it is at this point now that we stop short and realize that all the glaciers were trying to impart to us before they reluctantly departed. In our epic intergenerational story, we want to outline that we listen for an entire year to what the disappearing ice was trying to tell us. And during that year, the notion of glacial pace was turned on its head. What the ice suddenly said about the world we were about to lose opened our eyes. We never imagined that the Eden of the last 10,000 years was so fragile. At a cost we can't afford, we realize we have disrupted a fine balance. Without the delicate climatic thermal regulation of the ice, the earth may never have evolved the rare equilibrium of the Holocene and the extraordinary profusion of biodiversity of which we are part may never have happened. What the elements of the earth are trying to tell us is that the conditions of the past no longer prevail. They tell us that we do not live in the world that we did even 30 years ago. The Holocene, the epoch in which humans evolved and which our civilization is nested is almost over. As we watch the elements unravel before our eyes, we realize we are spinning faster and faster into a future in which we might not fit. What we're witnessing now makes it clear that the future is too distant a place for the mind to wander. We need to come back now and change direction. Our epic narrative will explain how the elements were also telling us that a better world was still possible and that we could still create that world, and we did. We needed, however, to hurry. We were witnessing a great bonfire of our natural heritage. Things were being lost that we had not yet found, and we needed to find them before they and we were gone. We listened. To this warning, in our narrative, we listened. And because we listened to science, we realized there was still hope and much hope for the future if we followed the water. Above all else, glaciers matter because water matters to us and to the world. And if you agree, please join our year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sanford. Um, I will now pass on the floor to uh, Corinne Schuster-Wallace. And Corinne is another member of the Canadian Steering Committee for the UN International Year of Glaciers Preservation. Um, and at the University of Saskatchewan, she's the Executive Director of the Global Institute for Water Security and is a UNESCO Chair in Mountain Water Sustainability. She's previously served as a Senior Research Fellow for the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health and the Public Health Agency of Canada. And she is the founder of the Women Plus Water Community. Her research utilizes a systems approach to water-related human health and water security issues in rural, remote, and marginalized community. Uh, Dr. Schuster Wallace is going to connect snow and ice to downstream water conditions and introduce us to World Water Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to bring greetings from the University of Saskatchewan main campus water community on what will be the UN World Day of Glaciers starting in 2025. I'm joining you this morning from Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory and traditional homeland of the Métis. And in recognizing the lands of the First Peoples, I also want to remind all of us that the waters that are so intimately connected with the land, they're the lifeblood of people, communities, and economies, as Bob has just reminded us. And they're also the reason that we're here today and tomorrow, as we will recognize World Water Day. As you've heard from different perspectives, mountains and the glaciers, ice fields, the snowpacks, um, uh, they're quintessential to the way in which we picture high mountains and they're under threat. 
heat domes, ash from wildfires, accelerating melt of these iconic tourist attractions, such as the Victoria and Athabasca glaciers and Peto, while warmer and drier winters such as this year result in less snow. Researchers, students, and field technicians from the water community at USASC in Saskatoon and in Canmore, and in partnership with the University of Calgary and other institutions and UNU Inwe, collaborate to better understand, model, and predict changes in snow and ice. And as you've also heard through the UNESCO chair with fellow members, Kerry Black, Fred Rona, James McPhee, and Diraj Pradanga, we're bringing a transdisciplinary and community-engaged approach to mountain water sustainability. These changes that we observe have direct impacts for downstream uses and users and University of Saskatchewan main campus being located in Saskatoon on the prairies. This is of significant interest to us, uh, particularly in terms of what's happening in the Rocky Mountains. Energy generation, agricultural production, industry and natural resources extraction, municipal and domestic use, recreation, ecosystem services, as well as spiritual and ceremonial needs, particularly for Indigenous peoples. As Zoe reminded us, in Canada, we use and value our frozen landscapes in so many different ways. And for this reason, glacier retreat and the loss of snowpacks, it's not just a mountain problem. This really does underscore the connection between the World Day of Glaciers and World Water Day, particularly this year with the theme of Water for Peace. And to echo Bob Sanford, this is why glaciers matter. Threats to our glaciers and mountain snowpacks threaten the very existence of the world's water towers, creating uncertainty around volumes of water released over time, and we saw this in John's presentation. These frozen resources are a natural water store, releasing water during warmer periods for the benefit of the adjacent plains, such as the prairies here in Canada, often across different political jurisdictions, whether within or outside national boundaries. And as such, Collaboration is going to become increasingly important. Collaboration across jurisdictions, collaboration across sectors, collaboration between research policy and practice towards more equitable and sustainable solutions. And so tomorrow, the Global Institute for Water Security on behalf of the water community at USASC will host a downstream event. And we're delighted that members of the Year of Glaciers for Canada will be joining us at that event. And so we'll have a keynote and panel discussion centered around collaboration, especially given the threat of a multi-year drought looming. Michelle Watson, a waterkeeper, will open the event, followed by an introduction to the International Year of Glacier Preservation by Bob Sanford, connecting our two events, as I said, and a presentation by Dr. Melissa McCracken from Tufts University. A panel discussion will bring the conversation to the prairies with representatives from the Saskatchewan Water Security Agency, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds, Mr. Wasisniohiwak First Nation, and the University of Saskatchewan. And I'd just like to say that you're welcome to join us online or in person at Saskatoon as a follow-on to the discussion today. Cooperation is essential for water resilient communities, sectors, and ecosystems. And it really does start with conversations such as these. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Dr. Schuster Wallace. Um, we'll now move into the question and answer period um, we're using audience questions. Thank you to those who have submitted questions and you can still do so using the Q&A function. I have a question um, for Ali, uh, this is from Mary, and she asks, how does OPE disposition in remote sites like the Arctic compare um, with ice lower south? Okay, I think I, am I unmuted? Oh gosh. You're, you're unmuted. Neither. Okay. Um, I answered that one and I'm on to Victor's. Um, oh. In general, yeah, I will say, so we're measuring, yeah, I probably breezed through the plots too quickly. We're measuring really, we being Environment Canada, very, very low concentrations, um, but measurable um, above our limit of detection and increasing. And, you know, we can link these to um, source and manufacture and all these things. So um, the general answer is that when you're closer to the source and source in the non-polar regions, um, things like OPEs, which we've also measured here on the Columbia Ice Field, are significantly higher um, than these small concentrations that we're measuring in the Arctic, the um, scary, impactful, whatever thing to me in measuring them, even though they are in lower concentrations in the polar regions is that we can measure them at all 
um, and that they're quite clearly linked to certain uh, use and manufacture elsewhere in the world, transported there. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I have another question here from Hannah um, and perhaps uh, John or Bob would like to comment on the vision for future Glacier Day events uh, within Canada and or worldwide. Well, I could uh, certainly make a remark on this. I think that what we're doing and what we have successfully done so far is to build a foundation for this year. And as John will attest, we were very lucky that the uh, resolution at the, uh, uh, at the UN uh, Security Council uh, was uh, adopted early enough for us to get a head start on this. So we intend to broaden this, so certainly in Canada, and uh, we hope also to integrate with other activities around the world, certainly in Europe and other places that plan to celebrate the year also. And the other thing that we want to do is that we uh, definitely want to uh, uh, base it all on science. Science is the foundation for this. But we also recognize that there are other ways of knowing and caring, and traditional knowledge is one of those. But also we want to, as much as possible, broaden the base of our year and the events that we have by including science's sibling, its magical long-term sister, art. And we need to have as many ways of interpreting and understanding what we're trying to do with this year as we possibly can. And I believe that that's how we will have the optimal effect on having Canadians understanding what glaciers mean. John? Yes, I uh, agree completely with that, Bob. And uh, the we're, we're operating this uh, ad hoc committee with a well-defined budget. It's, it's zero, um, but we're uh, working through collaborations and that's how we can get things done. One very important collaboration is with the White Museum in Banff. Um, which has, uh, uh, we had a successful exhibition of science and art uh, last year, Cold Regions Warming. And uh, so very happy that Ann Ewan and the uh, crew at the White Museum are, are are going to exhibit Meltdown from the Guardians of the Ice next year, starting, I believe, in late January. And we want to bring some science into that, into that event and do other events um, at the White Museum and use that as our, uh, one of our bases for doing this. Also, there's a tremendous need to bring the Canadian uh, snow and ice and mountain water scientists together. Um, we don't have a formal funding program to support this uh, research, but we can collaborate and uh, these can be very, very effective. Another organization that has a budget of zero is InArch, uh, which was able to collaborate and, uh, and help get coordinated mountain observations at about 60 sites around the world. So perhaps we can do this in Canada for the glacier year, get our observations going uh, in some uh, synchronicity and uh, and then also uh, bring in uh, improved uh, modeling and understanding and then connect with our communities, uh, the, uh, the communities around the mountains and in the north. And in particular, uh, I think we need to have a much greater discussion starting right now with the indigenous communities in these areas uh, to uh, so that we can one better understand the uh, tremendous uh, thousands of years base of in indigenous knowledge, um, see what braiding is possible uh, with this, with some of the findings that we have now. And uh, certainly when we look at solutions moving forward, uh, that has to be done with those communities. So we, these are the types of meetings that we need. And I, I saw mention of youth, that's, a, that's another one. Um, don't have a plan right now, but yes, we have to do that. One other thing that I'd just like to add uh, in response to that question, <clears throat> uh, we happen to have in this country uh, a magnificent national park system, and we hope to be able to collaborate with Parks Canada because they are stewards of some of the most accessible and spectacular glacier landscapes in the entire world, and we're hoping that we will have the opportunity to work closely with them in the coming year. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, on a related question, this is coming from Gareth. How can we and other organizations uh, work together with your group to best make this happen? Uh, these ideas that you've been talking about and catalyzing climate action by individuals and communities. Well, I can start with that one too, and then John can, can add to it. <clears throat> one of the things that's really important about this initiative is it's not prescriptive. We're not telling per 
partners what they must do. We're inviting partners to join and to see this as an opportunity to expand on and achieve their own goals. And for organizations like Gareth's, who are really concerned about environmental issues, we hope that they can find an avenue in this particular initiative that will help them be more successful in all of the things that they do that could perhaps supercharge some of the communication they have, be involved in uh, events with others that uh, showcase what they're doing and to help uh, their, uh, help them achieve the goals that they want. So we want people to see this as an opportunity, not just to commit to this year for the sake of the UN, but also to see the value of the UN year reflected in what they want to do. John? Yes, the, um, uh, this is a, a year for the globe and for Canadians. And so for this committee, we, uh, we're here to listen to idea, take in ideas, um, uh, draw connections, hopefully uh, help people get things going. The, uh, there's so many facets and aspects to this, um, and it uh, is far beyond science, of course. It's, uh, as Bob has mentioned, it's uh, snow and ice are fundamental to what it is to be Canadian. And um, whether you're uh, a young kid playing hockey on a pond in southern Ontario or uh, or an ice, ice climber in Kulani National Park. And um, and so we have to bring all these strands together and uh, realize that we are Ice Age people and we're losing our Ice Age right now. And uh, we have to adapt to this together. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question, this is directed to Ali. Um, this is from Yison. I'm sorry if I mispronounced their name. Um, are there plans to collect any ice core samples in different parts of the world other than northern altitudes? It would be nice to see uh, what glaciers in the tropics have to say about planet records in comparison to the ones in northern altitudes. Added, thank you. You're right. I think this is the pilot, Jason. Um, yes, um, there are many an ice core scientist who focus solely on tropical glaciers. I'm not one of them. I do, I myself do some nonpolar drilling, um, but high mountain nonpolar work. Um, but there are whole groups um, that are focused on retrieving paleoclimate records from, from the tropics. Um, and one really good example would be Lonnie Thompson's um, Kalkaya ice cap record from Peru. That is one of my favorites, but there's, um, you know, ice cores contain global climate information, but each core contains an enormous amount of environmental and climate information that's more regional and local. So we need records that are not just all from Greenland, the Canadian High Arctic and Antarctica. So that's, um, it's very important. Awesome, thank you. Um, and can we, or would any of you like to comment on the role of youth in the year of uh, glaciers preservation and in um, combating climate change? You go first this time, John, or Allison, if you want to, or Corinne. Like, um, I, I can say a few things. So one is by uh, some things that we already are doing. We have young professionals groups in some of our uh, science programs for the young professionals. But we also have been uh, going to, uh, for many years to the high schools and other and other schools in the Bow Valley um, to uh, talk to students, to show them the most up to date science. And then also uh, meeting with science uh, with students in the field at field sites in Kananaskis, which uh, we've been doing. So we need to do more of this and um, and happy to make connections with uh, with others. <clears throat> show us who to connect to and how, how to do that. And then there are wonderful programs such as Girls on Ice that uh, Carolyn Albury Wake has been fundamental with and, and others that uh, uh, once people get out in these environments with a bit of explanation, they're, they're transformed. And uh, the other thing is that the instructors learn a lot. Um, and, and, and we have to do this. This is the future and uh, we have to prepare people with what we know for the future, but they're the ones who are gonna have to ultimately find and implement the solutions to uh, make us a sustainable society. Um, my, my oh, go ahead, Corinne, please. Oh, I was sorry, Bob, I was just going to add that I completely agree. And it's the youth who are the generations of the future in the same way. And so engagement of youth is critical. 
and the UN has been challenged to uh, 30 by 30, and that is to have 30% youth engagement in events and activities by 2030, and so and to have youth as in under 30 as well. So we really do need to engage youth across all sectors, not just in academia and, and in research groups, but across all professions and, and water related sectors. Uh, Allison, do you want to offer anything on that? No, oh, sorry, I was okay. typing another another answer, but um, no, I I would have talked about Girls on Ice Canada. <laughs> so John already mentioned it. I think there's just um, there's just so much value in in getting out and um, experiencing and and joining whichever part of this movement um, speaks to you and aligns with you and your personality. So. No, I, not really. I don't have much to add. I, I would like to point out that the millennials have just, uh, for the first time, became a larger demographic than boomers. And I wish to point out that uh, <laughs> my generation, like the glaciers, are on their way out. <laughs> and what I think is really important, that this is going to be their turn. So the, it took us generations to get into this problem. It's going to take the next generations to to get us out of it. And if we can do anything for the in this initiative, it, it is for reasons of intergenerational encouragement. We need to help find the language and charge the vision of the next generation. And that has to be one of our principal goals. Fantastic. I'm just gonna end with one final question um, and just open the floor if you want to comment on um, strategies for effective communication with the public, given uh, the role of science and um, effective science communication in all of this, if each of the, the speakers or if one of you in particular just wants to offer a short piece of advice um, to any groups who hope to help uh, bridge those two subjects. Well, if, if, <laughs> I can go first if you want, but uh, one, one I think is really important is that we're living in a very, very difficult time right now when facts and truths are uh, being uh, reinterpreted uh, as alternative facts and truths. And uh, this is a dangerous time in which to live in terms of uh, communicating facts. The key thing, however, in my experience is that you have to stick with the science. You have to understand and communicate and find the language for communicating as best as possible what the science is telling us. And there's another thing that uh, we face as a complication in our time is that uh, uh, our democracy is under threat. And it's not that our democracies are necessarily failing, they are under uh, uh, organized assault. And uh, so we may have to rely on building our communities to, in order to make sure that we have the coherence the understanding and the common vision that will allow us to address the kinds of problems that the glacier year is going to underscore. This is going to demand a lot of us and we aim through this year to find the vehicles and the means and the language to encourage that and hopefully be an example to, to as many people as possible how working together that we might be able to achieve those ends. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and that will conclude our event. Thank you everyone for coming uh, and as well to all of our speakers. We're officially going to be launching the Glacier Year in, the, uh, in Canada at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies and Banff in January 2025. And please get excited for many more activities to come. We appreciate everyone tuning in and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of World Glacier Day. Thank you, Zoe. Okay. Bye, thank everyone. You, thank you for listening. It's a start.